Hey, thanks for joining us today. In this message, I'm talking about how you can develop the spiritual habit of joy. You can have more joy in your life. And I hope this message is a blessing to you, and I hope it brings you joy. Let's join the message now. Uh, Joy grows from our relationship with Jesus. Now, when you don't have it, I want you to understand, it affects everything in your life. Are you going to have sad times? Of course. But if you have no joy, what's going to happen? That sadness is going to dominate you. Um, Can you have anger? Well, the Bible says that Jesus got angry, so we, we know that not all anger is sin. God has anger at sin. Um, And so you can have righteous anger, but if you don't have joy in your life, you know what happens? That anger takes root in your life and you become just an angry person. And so what God wants us to understand is that we can pursue joy. You can develop it. You can cultivate it in your life. I'll tell you this. Uh, for lost people, people that don't know Jesus Christ. You know what attracts them to Christianity? It's not our morals. Some people are attracted to that, but most people are not. It's not political stances. It's not rituals that we go through. They don't really care about that. But you know, there's one thing that even atheists have to admit that when Christians have this, it is so attractive. You know what it is? It is joy. You can have joy in difficult circumstances. You can have joy when the doctor gives you a bad report. You can have joy when you lose a loved one. And for people that don't know Jesus Christ, that's a bit confusing, but it's incredibly attractive because they too, just like you, go through difficult times in life. They too lose jobs. They too have financial difficulties. They too have relationship problems. They, too, uh, lose loved ones, but they often have no joy to get them through. Now, the truth is, God takes joy very seriously. You may never have thought about this. Did you know that God established for the ancient Israelites, you know, he established all of these celebrations and these festivals and the, the bottom line is it was to remind them that God loved them. It was to remind them of their relationship with God. It was not about rules and regulations. It was about resting in him. It was about having joy in him. And he took it very, very seriously. In fact, he took it so seriously that it was a command to the Israelite people. Now, once again, you cannot command an emotion. I can command you to be happy, but you can put on a facade, but that may not be real happiness. But joy can be cultivated. And I want to show you today how you can do this. I've used this story before, but it bears repeating. It's a very good story, and it illustrates what we're talking about here. When I was 12 years old, uh, my dad had been in the ministry full-time as a pastor for about a year. And um, my dad was actually out preaching in another church than the one we attended on that Sunday. And we had gone to my grandmother's house after church, and we got a phone call that said, you need to come quickly, your house is on fire. Two days before Christmas, all of our presents were under the tree. It was a devastating thing. And my dad, he left where he was preaching in Virginia, not too far away from where we lived. And so uh, he got back there in North Carolina at our house. And my mom and dad were standing watching our house burn. And I remember my dad grabbed my mom's hand and he had a smile on his face. And I thought, ooh, that's weird, you know. Did you do something that we don't know about, Dad? Is there something devious going on here? Are you trying to collect insurance money? But he had a smile on his face. And he said this. He said, kids, it's going to be okay. And he quoted Job. He said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I'll never forget as a 12-year-old boy, I was a Christian. I had given my life to Christ. 
But that one particular event, I'm going to be honest with you, more than going to church, and I think going to church is important. You need to have your kids in church. I got instilled and grounded in the Word of God because going to church as a kid. But more important and more effective than going to church or any of the stuff that our family had done was watching my parents have joy in the midst of incredibly bad circumstances. Now, I want to read to you what the Apostle Paul wrote today of how you can make joy a regular spiritual practice. In other words, you don't have to wait for it to come to you. That's how most people think, that it's got to be a result of something that happens. But our joy is rooted in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm going to show you today how you can, in three ways, you can establish the spiritual habit of joy. You can build it up. You can practice it even when you're sad, even when you're at a loss. You can have joy. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse 20 through chapter 4, verse 9. I'm going to read uh, these verses uh, and talk about them. Then I'll read some more and I'll talk about them. 320, but our citizenship is in heaven. He just like comes right out of the gate as to why you should have joy. Our citizenship is in heaven. No matter what you go through, no matter how difficult it is, it's nothing compared to what awaits us when we see Jesus. You can lose a house. You can lose a job. You can lose a family member. You can lose your health. But you'll never lose the love of God in your life and the fact that when you're a believer, you're going to go to heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, and notice what he talks about here, and I think this is to get us thinking, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. There's a lot in that. We can have joy because Jesus has power over the circumstances. He can subject all things to himself. Jesus has the power to get you through. Jesus has the power to answer your prayers. But sometimes, because we cannot see what lies ahead, we can't see what is best, but God can. I'll I'll finish my story about my parents' house burning. My parents had taken a huge pay cut, go in the ministry. Uh, They weren't these televangelists that made lots of money. They were very poor, actually their first few years in ministry. And God used that house. There was a man in our uh, church, his name was Bobby Widener. And Bobby was a builder, and my dad asked him about coming and looking at the house. And so uh, he came to the house, and the insurance company declared that house and all the property in it was a complete, total loss. In fact, they gave my parents a check for the maximum amount And this builder, he came to our house. He said, if you'll let me look, I I believe I can help you and save you some money. Well, turns out he, as he stripped all of the sheetrock and all the stuff, it turns out that not a single stud that supports the house, not a single one was burned. And, And he said, I can spray paint this and it'll seal off the smell, and we can just kind of remodel this house. Well, what looked like a curse turned into a financial blessing for my parents. And in fact, they lived off of that for many years. They were in ministry, but a few years down the road, they would go into uh, the mission field, and my parents became missionaries in Mexico, and God used that money that he had given them to sustain them in their times of need. Sometimes the things you're going through, they look bad. You wonder, God, why? But Jesus knows what's in the future. And he knows what you need. And thus he said, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself, you can have joy because of that. But notice he said, he's gonna transform your body to be like his glorious body. Talking about the resurrected body of Jesus. It's going to be perfect. There's not going to be any more pain. 
Can I get an amen right there? No more pain. The older I get, the more I'm looking forward to having that glorious body like Jesus Christ. You know, when you get fat, uh, when you bend over, when you're fat, you think of what else can I do while I'm down here because I don't want to do this again. Because if you wait too long, you might pass out, all right? Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever get out of the shower and dry off and think you're completely dry and you bend over to pick up some deodorant and a pint of water pours out of your belly button? I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that glorious body. No more pain. No more sickness. No more sadness. No more sorrow. No more depression. Isn't that going to be a glorious day? And I kind of like to think about the things that Jesus did that are recorded in Scripture. He could eat with that resurrected body. I'm looking forward to eating the food in heaven. That's going to be wonderful. But you know what else he could do? He could just appear. Like the disciples were in a room and suddenly he appeared in the midst of them and at the ascension back to heaven, he kind of floated up and then boom, he was gone. Now, I don't know about you, but I think being able to move at the speed of thought is pretty cool. Now, what's the point? Not that I'm trying to give you some kind of sci-fi alien kind of thing to look forward to. I'm just simply saying this. If you want to have joy, he said in 4.1, therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord. And, And what is he saying there? He's saying, number one, guard your eyes. Guard what you look at. It is easy to look at the circumstances rather than Jesus. Did you know that? Remember when Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, Jesus was walking on the water. There was a storm and Peter did something that no other human had ever done except for Jesus Christ. He was walking on water. And you know what he did? He began to get his eyes on the wind and the waves and the problems. And we tend to do that, don't we? I mean, something miraculous happens. And we're experiencing it. And then we're like, oh, yeah, but, you know, rent has gone up. And my next door neighbor, they keep blowing their yard clippings over into my yard. And I've tried to talk to him about it, and he just ignores me. And at the meeting for the Homeowners Association, some guy called me a bad parent because my kid did something at the pool. And uh, when I go to drop my kids off at school, the teacher gets angry because, well, actually, I get angry at the teacher because she won't listen to me. And my boss, he is just so mean and grouchy. Do, Do we not tend to do that? We get our eyes on what? The circumstances. Not on Jesus, but the circumstances. Listen to Psalm 5, verse 11 and 12, and I love this from the message. He says, but you'll welcome us, talking about God, you'll welcome us with open arms when we run for cover to you. Having a problem, run for cover to Jesus. Having a relationship problem, run for cover to Jesus. Having a financial problem, run for cover to Jesus. Having a health problem, run for cover to Jesus. He says he'll welcome us with open arms. And then I love this, let the party last all night. God's serious about joy. He's serious about your joy. Stand guard over our celebration. I love that. God is going to be there in the midst of that celebration. He's going to stand guard. It says, you're famous, God, for welcoming God's seekers, for decking us out in delight. I love that. What do you got to do? Got to guard your eyes. Instead of looking at the circumstances, look to Jesus. Remember what God has done for you. And just like the apostle Paul said, stand firm in that faith, in belief, that we're awaiting a savior. We also have to remember that the best is yet to come. The problems in this life are only temporary. Every single problem that you have is only temporary. I got a dear friend, member of our church. His mother has been in hospice now for, I don't know, about two months maybe. And 
for about two months, they've told the family every single day, this is going to be her last. This is going to be her last. And she's still hanging on. I do not know why. But you know, it's easy for when you're going through that. I mean, it's normal to get tired. It's normal to get frustrated. But you got to remember that even in death, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. We haven't seen the best yet. No matter how good your life is, we have not seen the best. You've got to remember that the best is yet to come. Our problems in this life are only temporary, but our relationship with God is forever. And remember that he works all things for good. Let me give you an illustration of this. Uh, When Kim and I first met, it was the summer, actually May of 1982. And if you're a math whiz, you can figure out that in May, it's going to be 41 years since we started dating, okay? Now, let me tell you how this kind of happened, okay? We were in this group. We would go to churches, and we'd ministered. We'd sing, and we'd work with the youth, and we'd do all this stuff. And we did it to try to recruit college students to come to our college, our Bible college. And uh, we were in this bus. It was an old Bluebird bus. It was actually an old school bus, flat front, you know what I'm talking about? And we called it the chariot. I don't know why we called it the chariot because it certainly was not magnificent like a chariot. It was just an old painted school bus. And this was what took us from Florida uh, to all the places we went. We were in the mountains of Virginia and our bus broke down going up a hill. Now, you know how you got to just kind of let something glide if, it, if the engine stops or whatever. And the driver, he kind of let it glide. He got off on the side of the road. He was gliding it to a stop. And lo and behold, we stopped directly over the carcass of a dead dog. Yeah, you should have been on the bus, all right? It was not just a carcass, but it was a bloated. You know what I'm talking about? You touch it, it explodes like a balloon. You know what I'm talking about? That. And the smell, this was summertime. It was hot. We were on the side of the interstate. And I'm thinking, goodness gracious, that's not actually the words I was thinking, but nevertheless, this is a Christian thing. So I'm like, goodness gracious, this is awful. Finally, they got us in a hotel. Uh, all of our group, I don't know, it was about eight, 15 or 18 of us. And uh, we were in this hotel in the mountains of Virginia. It was beautiful, but it took about three days for the mechanics to fix the old chariot. About three days that we missed of driving around and ministering. Now, you might think, what in the world good could come out of that? That is an awful story. Uh, during those three days at that hotel... I began to take an incredible interest in Kim. (laughs) And I got my first kiss. Now, let me tell you, you you might be in a bad situation. It might smell like an old rotting dog's carcass. But when you keep your eyes on Jesus, listen, the best is yet to come. I got my first kiss, one of many now in the 41 years that have passed. We will have been married 37 years this May. And thank God, what looked like was going to be awful, God turned it for good. And the best is still yet to come. That's it. So you got to guard your eyes, stand firm in your faith. And it takes determination. Most of you know that I grew up in North Carolina. And I'm a big North Carolina Tar Heels fan. Uh, The North Carolina, North Carolina is called the Tar Heel State because during the 1700s, 1800s, it was the world's leading producer of tar, turpentine, and pitch. And that was a lot of stuff that was used uh, on ships and so forth. And it began to have a phrase that at first was derogatory Uh, they would tell those people, put some tar on your heels. What it became to be known as was a phrase that meant to stick with it. Don't give up. Stay in it. 
And in fact, it became the moniker, the, the slogan, and that's why North Carolina is known as the Tar Heel State. And the idea that you and I, when it comes to our relationship with God, sometimes we got to stick a little tar on our heels and just stick with it. Circumstances aren't always going to be good. Sometimes it may look bleak, but thank God we can guard our eyes. Why? When they're fixed on Jesus, everything is going to be okay. Everything uh, in this is going to help you develop joy, believe it or not. Romans 15, 13, may God, the source of hope, fill you with all joy and peace by means, how? Of your faith in him. Don't give up. Don't give up hope. Put some tar on your heels and stick with it. Stay in there. Why? Because the best is yet to come. He is the source of hope. He will fill you with joy. How? So that your hope will continue to grow, not by your self-effort, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. When you say yes to him, he says yes to you, and he is going to be with you, and he's going to guard you, and he's going to bless you. It doesn't always look like it, but trust me, he's always there. Guard your eyes. And then continuing on in Philippians chapter uh, 4, I entreat Euodia, and I entreat Syntyche. Now, if you're looking for names, if you're pregnant, there are two wonderful names. <laughs> Meet my daughter, Euodia. And my other daughter named Syntyche. I don't even know what that means. But I will tell you this. Here's what Paul wrote to them. These are two prominent women in this church. Now listen to this. This was so important that he put their names and their story, not their complete story, but he put it in the word of God for thousands of years for people like you and me to read about so we could learn from their circumstances. He says... I entreat Euodia and I treat, entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. They were having a problem. They were having an argument. They disagreed. Maybe they voted differently. Maybe they believed some things differently. Maybe they thought that one should raise her kids this way and the other one thought, no, you should raise your kids that way. Whatever it was, we don't know. But they had a disagreement that was so profound that God, through the Holy Spirit, recorded it for us in Holy Scripture. He said, yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement, and I don't know if Clement was a man or a woman, and the rest of my fellow, you know, uh, my fellow workers, and notice why. Notice the big thing they could agree on whose names are in the book of life. It's a very real thing that people quit going to church because, and I've heard this probably thousands of times in my ministry, people say, I used to go to church, but I was hurt by the church. And the fact is, it's impossible for you to be hurt by the church. You were hurt by individuals in the church. And God tells these two women, and notice, they were faithful. They labored in the church. They were high profile, and they had a falling out. And Paul, he didn't say, well, what you need to do is go to counseling. Now, I'm not against counseling, but that's not what Paul told them to do. He didn't say they need to go on a silence retreat he didn't say they needed to go somewhere to a summer camp during the summer and have a, a wonderful band and a good speaker speak where you get your cup full and you come back and it lasts for about three days and then you're back to your old self. He didn't say that. There's one thing he said, and I want you to get it, whose names are in the book of life. You may disagree with me, and it's okay for you to be wrong. All right, I just want you to know. I'll give you permission. If I ran the world, I'd fix all these problems, okay? Or at least in my mind, I think I would, right? And maybe you're that way. But here's what God says. 
get your eyes on the bigger picture. You may have a falling out with somebody because you didn't like them or they, maybe they were having a bad day and they said something bad to you or they harmed you or they hurt you. I don't know what it is, but I do know this. That's little piddly stuff. You know what God says? Remember that your name is written in the book of life. I can serve next to somebody that I don't agree with. And by the way, that is the way that the church is supposed to be. That's why you don't ever hear me talk about politics. And it's not that I don't vote, nor do I think you should not be involved. I think you should. But I don't think church is where you look at little piddly stuff. Because, you know, people are like, uh, which party do you like? Well, I don't really like either one of them, to be honest with you, all right? And maybe you're that way. But that's piddly stuff. You and I can disagree on who we vote for. You, can, you and I can disagree on a lot of things. But the big picture is that our name, if we're a believer, our name is written in the book of life. And I can have fellowship with you and I can rub elbows with you and I can serve right alongside of you and have joy. Why? I'm guarding my eyes. I'm not looking at the little stuff. And by the way, it's all little stuff. It's all little stuff. Well, I've spent a really long time on that first point, but that's okay. Here's the second point. Guard your heart. You see, these women love the Lord. They serve the church together, but Paul invited them to see the big picture. Now, if you want to have joy, you can't let problems and people distract you that we're in this together. You say, well, I don't like what time y'all start. That's okay. That's a little thing. You don't have to agree about that. Well, I don't like some of the stuff you got going on back in the children's ministry. That's okay. That's little stuff, okay? If you were in charge, you'd probably do it differently. I get it, okay? But the fact is, we must keep our eyes on Jesus. We must guard our eyes, and we gotta guard our heart. Well, then he continues on. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. In other words, that is something he commands. That pursuit of joy, uh, praising God. He said, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Do you know it's reasonable for a Christian to have joy, to pursue it? Uh, The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Don't worry, he says. Don't. Don't have coffee, cigarettes, and fingernails for breakfast. He said, it's going to be okay. You don't have to be anxious. You don't have to worry. He said, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's the key. It's when I bring my prayers to God, I'm, I'm reasonable. In other words, I think. I put myself in their shoes. I remember that God gave me mercy and grace, and I need to give it to someone else. I remember that God forgave me, and therefore I need to release forgiveness to others. I'm remembering that, and I'm being thankful. I'm remembering that even though it may look bleak, God has blessed me. I love some of our members. I ask them how they're doing. They say, I'm doing great. God gave me another day. And I love that. Why? Because that's pursuing joy. And God says that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. And when we do that, we'll have the right attitude. Here's the final thing. He said, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. He didn't say think about which celebrity got a new outfit or a new hairstyle. He didn't say think about all the salacious arguments on the internet and on social media. He didn't say, look at these people. They're the dumbest people on the planet because of what they put out there. He didn't say that. He said, if anything is pure and just and true 
and honorable, if it's lovely and commendable. He said, think about those things. What you fill your mind with matters. When you fill your mind with garbage all the time, you're going to have a bad attitude. That's the bottom line. I mean, it's true of me, and I know it'll be true of you too. And so he says, think about these things and what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. He's talking about the gospel. Practice these things. Practice what? Remembering that my name is in the book of life. Remembering that the little stuff doesn't matter. Remembering that I can be reasonable and, and I can have the love of God and forgive and I can think about things that are true and honorable and all these things. He says, when you do this, when you practice it, the God of peace will be with you. Do you know why my parents had joy at the burning of the Miller household? Christmas time. All the presents were gone because the God of peace was with them. That's why. That's the only possible way. And they had joy. Why? Because they thought on the right things. And this is the final thought. You got to guard your attitude. You guard your eyes, you guard your heart, and you guard your attitude. Joy is a reasonable expectation for Christians. Worry detracts from our joy. Prayer and giving thanks helps you retain joy. And what we think about determines the level of our joy. If you're depressed or you think you feel, you ever just look at something, maybe you binge watch a show and you've watched eight hours straight of the stupid thing and you just kind of feel yucky. You know what I'm talking about? You feel dirty. Not that you're watching a dirty show, but you just feel like you've wasted time and you're just, uh, you know, you're a couch potato and all of this stuff. You just feel yucky, right? He said that when we think about the right things, it'll raise our level of joy and we got to practice it. And I want you to understand this. God is more interested in your character than he is your comfort. You might be going through some things to grow your joy. You're just not working at it. Listen to what Romans 5, 3 and 4 says. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Doesn't that sound like a person you want to punch in the mouth? How's it going? I know you've had your car broke down on the way to work and uh, you're upside down on the pavement and you got cut at your job and you're not, you don't have any income coming in how you do oh i'm doing great praise god and you just feel like punching them and the reason why do we have that reaction because we don't have that kind of joy that's the only reason it's not that you think they're weird it's that you look at that and you think boy i wish i had that and here's the good news you can you can but pursue jesus When you do that, he says, uh, we go through these things, we can rejoice. Why? Because we know that they're good for us. They help us to learn to be patient. Ooh. Lord, give me patience, but I want it right now. Right? And the patience develops strength of character. When you learn to be patient, God's going to grow you. He's going to strengthen you. It helps us trust God more each time we use it until finally our hope and faith are strong and steady. That's what he wants. And that's what he wants for you and me. So here's the question. How are you doing in the joy department? How are you doing in the joy department? How are you doing in the peace department? The good news is you can think about the right things. You can remember that your name is written in the book of life. You can remember that things are getting better, that one day you'll be in heaven. You'll have no more of these problems. You can remember that God is with you. You can start thinking on the right things. And what's going to happen? You're going to have joy and peace. And when the fire comes, you'll stand steady. You won't give up. You won't throw in the towel. And when the offense is coming, by the way, they will come. I've had so many bad things said about me, it's almost turned into a funny game to me. 
I've had people, I've given my entire life and career ministry to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I've had people in their ignorance and in their hurt accuse me of not caring for and not preaching the gospel. I couldn't have a worse thing said about me, I don't think. But you know what I've learned to do? God's built character in me, and I just kind of, I let that just roll right off my back. You know why? Not because I'm some awesome guy. It's not that, trust me. If I got my way, sometimes you'd be shocked, okay? You'd be shocked at some of the things I think. Um, you know, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna admit that sometimes when people do me wrong, that I think about, you know, what it would be like just to go up and, and just slowly beat them half to death. I won't say that, okay? But my dreams, okay, in my dreams, I cannot be held responsible for what I dream, all right? And I'll just tell you, almost 99% of all the dreams that I dream, that I remember, I'm fighting somebody. I, if you knew what went on in this crazy head, you would not come to this church, most likely. Now, what am I saying? I'm simply saying that God says our hope and faith can be strong and steady. And I hope that's what you have. And if you don't, you can't have it. How? Guard your eyes. Look at Jesus. Guard your heart. What you think about, the things you put in it, guard your attitude. Remember that you too need God's grace. And I believe when you do, you'll have joy. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us to have joy. Sometimes circumstances are difficult. Sometimes it's hard, but you always develop character in us and you always, when we trust you, fill us with joy. Lord, I pray for anyone that is watching online or anyone that is in the room today. May today be the day. If they need salvation, may today be the day that they pray, they pray a prayer something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave for me, not just to forgive my sins, but to make me right with the Father. I'm asking you to save me and be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.